Okay, it is two o'clock Eastern, one o'clock here in Wisconsin. So I think we're about ready to get started. I know we still have a few participants that are connecting in, um, but we'll go ahead and, and start some detail work here. So I wanna welcome everyone to this webinar and I thank you for joining us today. Um, on this special webinar, I know it was kind of a, a short notice, but a great opportunity that came up for us to be able to um, talk about the ESF 11. And so we're taking that opportunity um, today. This is Cheryl Skolis. I am an agricultural safety and health specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with the Division of Extension. So I am Wisconsin's point of contact, but I am also this year serving as the Eden National Chair. So I'm glad to um, be able to serve all of you in that role and also glad to help be your moderator today. For those of you who are just coming on, um, please take the opportunity in the chat box to provide us with your name and institution so that people can see um, who's, who's all on and just the, the diverse crossed institutional um, participation that we have and um, all the different states that, that we have joining us for this webinar. Their presentation is going to be ESF 11, Agricultural and Natural Resources, What Extension Needs to Know in Supporting the USDA. And our speaker is Mike Surak. And we just recently had an opportunity to meet Mike um, while Abby and Andrea Higdon and um, myself were out in Washington, D.C. for some meetings and so took that opportunity to help bring this webinar to you. So on the back side of this webinar, I also want everybody to know that we have Abby Hostetler um, handling um, the technical side for us today and also she's done a great job of helping get the arrangements together for the webinar. Um, just a little housekeeping as we get rolling here. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box in your Zoom control panel. Um, I'll bring them up at the end of the presentation, so we'll let Mike go through things, and then we'll go into a Q&A. I would also want to note that we are going to be recording this webinar so that those who are not able to join us today um, will have a chance to, to listen to that recording and it'll be available for further use and, and some discussions. As we get rolling here, I will drop a link into the chat box for an evaluation and towards the end of this, um, please um, submit that evaluation. And if you don't have a chance now, um, we'll put it back in um, later as we get going. So now, um, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter. And Mike Sarek, thank you so much for joining us today. Mike is the Deputy National Coordinator for Emergency Support Function, ESF 11, um, Agriculture and Natural Resources. He has an extensive background in emergency management and disaster preparedness um, dating back to 1981. He had a 20 year active duty career in the US Air Force. He worked in the private sector for several years before joining USDA APHIS as the emergency management dispatcher in January of 2017. And in October of 2018, Mike was reassigned to his current position with ESF 11 and his primary responsible for managing disasters response operation and training. So with all of that, Mike, welcome. Thank you again. And we look forward to hearing what you're going to tell us in the next few minutes. Wow, I'm going to be hard, hard felt to live up to my own biography, I think. <laughs> but thank you, Cheryl. Um, can you hear me okay? Just make sure of that. Yes, Mike, we can hear you okay. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, emergency support function number 11, or ESF for short. 
Um, ESF-11 is one of 15 ESFs assigned under the National Response Framework uh, that supports disaster operations uh, during any Stafford Act uh, disaster uh, that's declared by the president or um, any other function that FEMA decides they need to stand up uh, the National Response Coordination Center to a level one or all agency activation. <clears throat> ESF 11 is actually made up, uh, comprised of two uh, government departments, the Department of Interior and the United States Department of Agriculture, and four separate programs when you count those two. Plus within USDA, there's the Food and Nutrition Service and also the Food Safety Inspection Service. Uh, USDA FNS, they work with states to provide food, which is stored in schools, state and federal warehouses, food banks, local disaster feeding organizations for disaster congregate feeding, and in some cases, even household feeding. Uh, the foods are not pre-designated or pre-positioned for disaster response, but if needed, uh, FNS can make emergency procurements of food that takes two to three days generally to deliver. Um, they identify, secure, and arrange for the transportation of those foods and commodities, and they approve state requests to operate what is called the DSNAP program, which stands for Disaster Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, uh, very similar to the food stamps program. Um, it provides a month of benefits to low-income families who have had disaster-related expenses and are in need of short-term food assistance. If they're not already part of SNAP or the regular food stamps program. There's a total of uh, 15 programs, uh, feeding programs nationally, which include SNAP and WIC, just to name a few. Uh, <clears throat> USDA APHIS portion of ESF 11 provides for integrated federal, state, tribal, and local response to an outbreak of a highly contagious or economically devastating animal or zoonotic type disease or an outbreak of harmful or economically significant plant pest or disease. APHIS is a multifaceted agency with a broad mission, it includes protecting and promoting U.S. agricultural health, regulating genetically engineered organisms, administering the Animal Welfare Act, and carrying out wildlife damage management activities. These efforts support the overall mission of USDA, which is to protect and promote food, agriculture, natural resources, and related issues. Oops, sorry about that. Let me just go back one there. FSIS is the Food Safety and Inspection Service. Okay? They ensure that the nation's food supply of meat, poultry, and egg products uh, are taken care of. Uh, the DOI aspect of ESF 11 organizes and coordinates the capabilities and resources of the federal government to facilitate the delivery of services, technical assistance, expertise, and other support for the protection, preservation, conservation, rehabilitation, <laughs> recovery, and restoration of natural and cultural resources and historic properties through all phases of an incident requiring a coordinated federal response. So uh, as an example, um, let's use California and the earthquake. Um, it happened in the Mojave Desert, which is uh, a big part of that is a, a uh, federal park national park so doi was uh involved as was esf 11 as a whole uh after the earthquakes struck this weekend okay uh another big part uh, of the understanding of esf 11 is that we work hand in hand with several of the other esfs um, primarily esf 6 which is Mass Care, Emergency Assistance, Housing, and Human Services. Also ESF number eight, which is Public Health and Medical Services, and ESF nine, Search and Rescue. Okay, and you know, that whole uh, a joint effort 
at the National Response Coordination Center makes for a smooth response into recovery of any ongoing incident. <clears throat> okay, uh, you may or may not already know that FEMA is broken up, uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, is broken up into 10 regions for easier management of disasters around the country. Um, ESF 11 has a coordinator in each of those regions, and you see those here uh, on the map that's displayed. Um, some regions, you can tell just by looking, are more active than others, uh, and some are less. For example, Region 8, which takes care of Montana and Colorado and the Dakotas, um, not nearly as busy year round as say region nine, which has California, uh, the, the Marshall Islands and Guam. Um, so that, you know, or region four, which has Florida and the Eastern seaboard uh, during hurricane season and the same with region six, which could be much busier than some of the other regions. Some of the uh, most recently activated include Region 7. Uh, oops, I'm sorry about that. That should not be ringing. Okay, uh, Region 7, which was activated for the Midwest flooding and blizzards and high winds, uh, particularly in Nebraska, Missouri, Iowa areas. Uh, we just uh, yesterday deactivated Region 9, which was activated for the earthquakes out in Southern California this past weekend. Um, now we've got a potential tropical disturbance in the Gulf of Mexico, so our Region 4 and Region 6 coordinators uh, are going to have a little heightened awareness in the next few days to see what goes on down there. <clears throat> Our core capabilities, uh, very basic really, there's, there's five primary areas that we look to support initially as objectives during any disaster. Um, they're listed on this slide here, and a lot of them came about after 2004 when Homeland Security Directive 7 and 9, excuse me, Directives 7 and 9, uh, were passed and the National Response Plan was implemented. Uh, that's when ESF-11 got tasked to provide protection of natural and cultural resources uh, and more to the animal and plant diseases and the safety and security of the commercial food supply. In 2008, we had uh, the last function added provided the safety and well-being of household pets. Um, which in itself is becoming a bigger and bigger chore uh, as disasters occur. Um, again, in the recent history, uh, the Camp Fires and the Butte County Fires in California, as well as Hurricane Katrina, uh, showed a need for someone in the federal government to assist with the feeding, the collecting, the sheltering, the watering of animals. Uh, that are left behind uh, by humans who are forced to evacuate on short notice or cannot take their animals to a shelter uh, because the shelter rules don't allow it or something along those lines. Um, so that applies primarily to small farms, not necessarily agribusiness, cattle and pork producers or poultry producers like that. But uh, in the case of the campfires, you know, you might have a 10 acre farm and you might own, you know, a dozen head of cattle or, or you know, a small stable of horses that you couldn't bring with you uh, when you evacuated because of the fire. Well, um, if through the grace of God, those animals survive the fire, they still have to be fed and taken care of medically after, you know, it's safe for people to go back in, responders to go back in. And uh, that's one of the things that we took care of. Um, nutrition assistance, I pretty much talked about when, when we covered uh, the first slide. Um, responding to animal and agricultural health, 
Um, I want to point out that there's a difference between the APHIS statutory response requirements and the Stafford Act federal response requirements. Um, for anything that is already covered under APHIS statutory authorities, uh, for instance, right now, that would be something like virulent Newcastle disease or a European cherry fruit fly up in western New York or the spot and lantern fly in Pennsylvania. Um, APHIS is statutorily bound to respond to those incidents and try to eradicate the invasive pests or the invasive diseases in the case of virulent Newcastle disease. In a federally declared disaster where the Stafford Act has been implemented by the president, um, we can be tasked with a lot more um, that goes along the lines of outside the statutory and more towards the five core capabilities that you see here on this slide. Um, it gets very um, politically complicated sometimes, but um, the bottom line is that uh, USDA, APHIS, ESF-11, DOI will do pretty much whatever it takes to take care of the five bullet points you see on this slide um, with, of course, the assistance of several non-governmental organizations and volunteer organizations that are also assigned down at the uh, National Response Center or around the country. Okay, um, I'm just, the next few slides are gonna take us through um, each of the four organizations within ESF-11, starting with APHIS. Um, the first thing to point out is that APHIS, or Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, was designated by the Secretary of Agriculture to be the lead uh, agency for ESF-11, which is what put me and the chair I'm in today. Um, our, our job is to provide agriculture and natural resources support to states, tribes, and other federal agencies during disasters and emergencies, um, to provide technical expertise for livestock assistance following natural or man-made disasters, and to coordinate plant, veterinary, and wildlife services when requested. Um, the second bullet here um, is important to differentiate between providing subject matter expertise and providing actual, uh, let's say, feeding and rescue services. Um, a lot of the uh, feeding and rescue services, as I alluded to in the last slide, are performed by non-governmental agencies that work with APHIS through a mutual support agreement and ongoing cooperative agreements to help us out. A lot of the food, for instance, um, in Nebraska with the floods, uh, we needed hay, lots of hay to feed stranded cattle, um, comes through donations. And the transport of that stuff can either be arranged with federal resources if available and funding is available, or through private uh, organizations like Code 3 or uh, the Humane Society or the SPCA or Red Rover. Um, all these organizations help us to carry out our mission. Um, I probably just covered some of this slide because um, I wasn't reading ahead, but <laughs> um, we talked about this a little bit earlier. We provide the technical assistance and subject matter expertise for everything, including evacuation, transport, sheltering, husbandry, and veterinary care of affected household pets. And sadly, um, in a way, uh, FEMA's number one responsibility is, of course, human life. So, you know, once we get human life uh, and take care of uh, some of the other uh, primary lifelines, if you will, because uh, FEMA response now operates under a concept of critical lifelines, um, and that is to establish the indispensable services that allow a community to start to get back to normal. 
but it's also uh, these lifelines are used to enable the continuous operation of critical business, government functions, and everything else that's critical to human health and safety or economic security if it's not repaired or promptly restored. So once we take care of that, um, the pets and the, the other animals kind of fold in in a cascading effect. Um, like I said earlier, Hurricane Katrina, uh, a couple of the uh, responses since have shown that, hey, you know, the loss of a pet to an individual family you know, could be as devastating as the loss of any other family member. Um, I know that as a, a, a former pet owner, um, any of you that have pets probably feel the same way. Hey, this pet is part of my family. And, you know, if I can get it rescued, I want it rescued. Well, that rescue um, thankfully comes with the help of our coordinating and cooperating agencies as well when they're not available. Uh, and if funding permits, through APHIS agencies like Animal Care, Veterinary Services, Wildlife Services, et cetera. Uh, we work hand in hand with the ESF-6 folks and the ESF-8 folks down at the NRCC to make sure these type of things are addressed in the planning and executed in the operations of any disaster response. Another thing that APHIS does is, again, we're addressing the potential for plant disease outbreaks, as well as the eradication of infective exotic plant disease or infestation from invasive species. Uh, in most cases, um, plant protection and quarantine does their best to basically eradicate an invasive species that would be um, affecting American agricultural business. Another, uh, and that would be one of their statutory requirements and statutory responses. Um, in, a, in a major disaster, let's use a hurricane, for example, and um, again, stay recent, let's talk about Hurricane Michael in Florida last year. Um, there was a tremendous loss of lumber and trees um and the debris field for that was crazy crazy big the responsibility that APHIS would have in that cleanup would be if it was determined or suspected that an invasive spe species excuse me was present in that debris field of of fallen trees uh, and other lumber. Um, we would have to send people to make sure before that debris is um, disposed of that any invasive species were clear of it. Uh, similar for bringing in hay from uh, other places, different states, um, you know, or any other sort of vegetation, um, you would have to make sure, or, or animal and livestock for that matter, um, if there's dead cattle to be disposed of, um, it's not APHIS's responsibility or ESF-6 response, excuse me, ESF-11 responsibility to remove that debris, even though it is an animal. However, if the animal has a possible uh, disease or something that could be transmitted to humans or present some other health hazard to humans, then APHIS or ESF-11 would be responsible to go in and help clean that up. Otherwise, it's left, uh, debris removal that is, is left to the Army Corps of Engineers. <clears throat> uh, food and Nutrition Service, their role in ESF-11 is to coordinate with ESF-6, again, mass care, and other non-governmental organizations to support congregate feeding of disaster survivors. A USDA foods through Food and Nutrition Service are only provided 
when the state requests assistance. We don't just go in and say, here's a bunch of food, do something with it. The state that is affected has to request federal assistance of food and feeding, and in turn, uh, Food and Nutrition Service will provide that. We have food stocks in schools and uh, warehouses and all of that uh, that is stored as bulk food. Um, so keep in mind, in the event of a disaster with shelter operations, uh, somebody at the state or region level has to determine how many people have to be fed, how many meals per day that are nutritious, um, taking into account uh, cultural sensitivities uh, and the location of, of where this disaster occurs because some of the food they have may not be the type of food that these folks are used to eating and it might upset their uh, digestive systems and you make, make a bad thing worse. Um, our USDA foods are stored in bulk, which means that I'm not going to send you 5,000 pre-made meals, but I may send you a thousand cans of applesauce, <laughs> just using that as an example, you know, X hundred pounds of meat products, uh, X hundred pounds of starch, and then you at the receiving end would have to break it down into meals per person. That's why before it's distributed, we have to get an estimate of how many people, how many meals, and how much food do you need? Um, as I said, a lot of it comes from uh, school programs. USDA foods are provided to the states um, for their schools, so it's already paid for. We just have to get permission from the state to use that food or a request from the state to use that food. They in turn can use it and then later be um, restocked through USDA foods to make up for that loss that they had in their school supply or whatever. Household distribution um, only happens under extreme circumstances. People can't get to shelter or they're so isolated um, and they can't get out, but we can get in uh, to maybe bring some food if needed. Um, DSNAP, the Disaster Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, uh, is a great program to use once the power and normal food sources are restored. That's the key. Um, it has to be requested by the state. It has to be authorized by FNS. And it can only occur um, except in uh, a few accepted circumstances, and I'll give you one in a minute, uh, when the power is back and when debit cards can be accepted because that is generally how the program is administered. Um, the state requests, USDA provides, the state then manages the program and the security of the cards that are used as vouchers for food, okay? It's fully administered by the state. Um, and it doesn't happen until we have grocery stores where people can go and buy food or food banks that become open for people to go and buy food, or any place where they can go, get food, swap their debit card, which is their DSNAP card, and uh, walk away with what they need and what's authorized. In very few instances uh, does it happen on a different type of system. In Puerto Rico, we had a problem uh, with hurricanes uh, Maria in Irma and I want to say Jose uh, because they didn't have power for a long, long time. So they made exception and found a paper system to use for the DSNAP program. Um, but you have to be very careful because this stuff has to be, you know, it's money. It has to be secured. It has to be accounted for. Um, and that's where the state is responsible. The USDA and the Food Nutrition Service provides it, but after that, it's the state's responsibility to secure it and account for it.
the Food Safety Inspection Service, or FSIS, is charged with protecting the public's health by ensuring the safety of meat, poultry, and processed ag products. Um, these are the people that put the stamp on. It says USDA grade A beef, et cetera. Um, they perform the inspection and verify the food safety aspects of food at the producer level. They inspect uh, restaurants. They inspect um, food processing plants. Um, they inspect uh, and verify the disposal of adulterated, regulated meats, poultry, and processed egg products. Um, again, like it says in the last bullet there, uh, they generally inspect wholesale rather than retail, although for special events where there are large feeding or mass feeding circumstances, uh, like the Super Bowl or some large um, uh, I'll just throw out something like a, a, a political party convention where there's a lot of public food. Um, they may inspect and, and verify there that the food is safe. Um, and that is their vision to make sure that everyone's food is safe, both before and after a disaster strikes. Uh, Department of Interior, our other departmental partner in the uh, ESF 11 quadrangle um, is responsible for all the things you see on this slide, the Fish and Wildlife Services, the natural, National Parks, Bureau of Reclamation, Indian Affairs, U.S. Geological Survey, Mineral Management Service, Bureau of Land Management, uh, and they're providing the, the uh, guidance for assessment, recovery, and stabilization of historic sites, structures, museums, archival collections and other cultural resources. Uh, basically, if, if it has a historical marker in front of it, um, DOI ESF 11 is responsible to make sure that it is either restored or protected at time of disaster. Okay, uh, environmental policy and compliance wing of, of DOI make sure that uh, the, cult the natural and cultural resources, which you see broken down at the bottom of the slide, are taken care of, that their, their damage is minimized and that they are stabilized after a disaster. Natural disaster falls into things like um, land and, and water systems, threatened and endangered species, migratory birds, um, invasive species mapping and geospatial data, whereas cultural resources are more physical, structural, um, solid, inanimate objects. Archaeological resources, museums, um, could be something like an, a, a Native American cemetery, uh, things like that. <clears throat> um, most recently, again, um, in the case of, I want to say it was Missouri recently, um, again, as a result of flooding, they had to do uh, some digging to uh, put temporary housing in place to shelter people that were affected by the floods. Um, DOI they, was reached out to by the state, ESF-11. Uh, they reached out to ESF-11, DOI, to have an archaeologist come by and watch the digging in the event that they dug up uh, what could have been Native American uh, relics or burial grounds. Uh, so that's one of the uh, interesting taskings that came about to ESF-11 recently. <clears throat> Other USDA agencies with disaster-related and response and recovery authorities um, include the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, Farm Service Agency, Risk Management, uh, Rural Development when it comes to assisting with more permanent housing, uh, and uh, anything that could happen as a result of the Secretary of Agriculture's declaration of an agricultural-type emergency. <clears throat> Most of the 
uh, agencies, actually all the agencies that you see here listed on this slide, come more into play after the disaster has entered into the recovery phase. Um, because it's all stuff, uh, basically, that almost all of it deals with a checkbook. Um, it's where we issue our loans and our grants. The farmers get their indemnity insurance, excuse me, indemnity insurance reimbursed. Uh, crop damage is assessed. The economic impact of crop or animal production facilities is assessed. And um, grants and loans are then delivered afterwards to help cover the economic loss of those damages. A lot of the information that these particular agencies deal with does not get released to the public um, because of the overarching economic impact to global and U.S. markets. Um, they simply don't want to announce that, you know, X million dollars worth of cattle or livestock may have been lost or corn or soybean or whatever because that is going to have an immediate and definite impact on the stock market and the sales around the globe. You know, um, so we don't generally release the specifics of that type of information. However, the people in agribusiness, the farmers, uh, they know how to contact Farm Service Agency to get an assessment of their uh, crop impact, their animal loss. Um, rural development, they're basically a, an open checkbook when the, when the states start requesting help in rebuilding, um, they provide that service. <clears throat> okay, uh, these are some of the more recent examples up until the last couple weeks where we had an earthquake and uh, the Nebraska flooding and things like that, but uh, some of the places where ESF-11 has responded, um, you know, Typhoon U-2 out in the Pacific. Um, there was a case of a very sick lion and tiger at a zoo in Saipan uh, that was destroyed. But uh, fortunately, the enclosures for these two particular animals did not get destroyed, and they were able to be housed, but they were in bad shape. And the only help, uh, or the best help that they could receive was back in Denver, Colorado. Um, thanks to a non-governmental organization, a, an aircraft was provided. Um, our ESF-11 Region 9 coordinator was on site to oversee the animals being evacuated, um, put into this airplane with a veterinarian, um, accompanying them all the way back to Denver, um, one of the missions that ESF-11 carried out. Uh, in the campfire, uh, I already mentioned that uh, after the fires, which were so fast moving, there was really no time for people to take care of their farm animals or pets. Um, animal care, wildlife services, veterinary services uh, went in uh, after a certain time when the NGOs or non, the non-governmental organizations um, did the best they can, but uh, there was a time when they had to back out and leave it to a federal response, and we responded to help uh, round up, treat, feed, and in some cases uh, reacquaint the pets to their rightful owners. Um, and that's the kind of mission that makes you happy to see work out well. Um, unfortunately, you also have the downside of that, which are deceased animals, animals that get burned, animals that get crushed, et cetera, or in some cases never found. So uh, that's the downside of that type of, uh, that task that we have. Um, <clears throat> in some cases, uh, like the one referenced here in the Puerto Rico Virgin Island hurricanes, um, USDA may have a very small facility uh, at the, the disaster site that might otherwise be overlooked as, hey, that's just one building, we're not gonna worry about it. But in this case, that one building contained an $80 million Caribbean seed repository 
that, you know, the farmers on those islands needed to, you know, keep their businesses going long after FEMA was out of there. Um, so in order to keep the seeds alive, we provided generator fuel and kept that thing going uh, throughout until it was finally restored back to its normal status. Haitian earthquake, um, you can see we did a lot repatriating, surveying for animal and plant diseases, restoring mango export operations, and six million tons of rice through FNS and FSA contracts. Now, Haitia, or excuse Haitia, Haiti is not a, um, a U.S. You know, uh, province or, or state or even uh, territory, but we did provide that assistance. So again, outside the realm, but still something that we could help with. Um, and the the Red River flooding in 2009, that was unique um, because you say, where does USDA get explosives? <laughs> um, and that came from wildlife services that they used to break up beaver dams and things like that in their normal day-to-day -day business. But in this case, we used it to dislodge ice damming and mitigate a lot of the flood damage up in North Dakota. So to summarize, uh, run things up. If the situation threatens the nation's agriculture and natural resources, whether it's plant, whether it's animal, whether it's meat, poultry, ag products, uh, a historic landmark, ESF-11 is the coordinating agency that the federal government used to take action to meet the needs of response and recovery. Uh, services are intended to support rather than replace the state, tribal, and local response to the incident. And that's an, an important note, even though it's in the summary. Um, keep in mind, any disaster response is managed pretty much at the lowest level. So the state tells the region what they need. So in that aspect, the region works for the state. The region tells the federal government what they need. So in that aspect, the federal government actually works for the region to coordinate the assistance that's needed to successfully recover from this disaster in particular. So many different organizations, many different levels of government, two different departments, several uh, non-governmental organizations, everybody working together to make sure that people and places are taken care of after any big disaster. So with that, um, I'll, I'll prepare to field your questions. Um, just to reiterate, I'm Mike Sirak. I'm the Deputy National Coordinator for Operations and Training with ESF-11. My boss is Mr. Ron Walton, and we're both located up here in Riverdale, Maryland at APHIS headquarters. So Cheryl, if there's any questions, I'm ready. Okay, sounds good. And just a reminder um, that just type your questions into the chat box um, in your Zoom controls so that we'll all, I'll be able to see them and can provide those back to Mike. So Mike, thank you. The first question that came in is, um, would the group be able to get a copy of your PowerPoint presentation? Sure. I'll. I'll send that to you right after we're done. Okay, and then we'll work with, Abby can help um, find a way for people to access it or a place to, to house it. So um, that, that'll be helpful for you. The next question is, does our local, oh, okay, I took my glasses off now. Oh, <laughs> OEM have to trigger ES of 11 response or can a lo the local cooperative extension do it? Um, generally, an ESF-11 response is controlled by the state. They will uh, activate their state emergency operating center, and in turn, they will determine which ESF resources they need to respond. Uh, and then it, it happens in a cascading effect the same way for the federal government. Um, there could be a level one, which is all, level two, which is you know, uh, a selected few and and level three, which is which is uh, a little bit more than enhanced watch. But 
Uh, in general, it would have to come from the state through the region uh, and up the chain. And I think that that goes back to your point about, you know, that it that that is that lowest level. And I think for our local cooperative extension and our staff out there, you know, it's important to be in on those local conversations as a response is happening, um, as you hear of the needs, um, so that that local office of emergency management has the the information, um, the support needed to help move um, those requests up up to that state level um, for the response and, and helping to get that triggered. Um, so our next question is um, from Julie Smith and she says, hi Mike, you mentioned VND. Has there been an ESF activation to support the CDFA response? Uh, short answer is no, because it's a statutory response for veterinary services. Okay. So there's, 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 does that make sense? There's, there's not a, an ESF activation. California is, has requested assistance, but because it's a statutory um, responsibility for veterinary services, they don't need to go through and go all the way up through the region and get an ESF representation on that. APHIS is handling that as a statutory responsibility. In, um, into the chat. So the next, there was a comment in there um, from Jeannie to everybody that the local and state EFS response without a federal ask, or res there is also a local response, um, ESF 11, without a federal ask or response. So getting involved in local emergency planning um, to assist with that ESF 11 is an important activity. The next question, are there any organizations that can be partner with to acquire and store emergency supplies and PPE for cleanup. And so this is coming from Alyssa Spence. Um, that question, um, Alyssa, would probably be best directed to the local authorities based on mutual support and cooperative support type agreements that they have with various agencies and storage facilities. Uh, that would be something that we really wouldn't wouldn't touch if it's local planning, especially. So, and this conversation is really showing, you know, a lot of, of different um, levels levels to everything here. I am. Um, so the next question coming in from Greg Martin: In the case of a foreign animal disease. Wouldn't national stockpile come into action? Possibly, yes. That is that's the best answer I can give you there. Um, we did, um, in the case of Nebraska floods, we activated uh, some of the national veterinary stockpile to assist with the cleanup of the carcasses uh, and things like that, so yes. Um, so Jeannie Rankin is just sharing national stockpile and for veterinary diseases or animal disasters, there is an ask for USDA for national vet veterinary stockpile and that might be a, another area um, for conversation and discussion in, in a webinar for us. Any other questions that somebody's pondering out there? I just wanted, while you guys are pondering those questions, um, to, to add a couple things in from our recent discussion um, when we met with Mike and we, we met with Ron Walton and others out in DC. So since Extension's involvement um, with ESF 11 goes back, um, we were first identified back in, in 2013 on ESF 11 officially. Last year, there was a conversation um, in Washington, D.C., and Eden um, Beverly Samuels, our USDA NIFA um, Eden liaison, um, brought us into the conversation 
and we were represented from, by Noel Estwick out of Texas, Scott Cotton with Wyoming, and my, Wyoming, and Mike Yoder from, from North Carolina. So that kind of was the initial conversation of what's Extension's role, how do we help understand this? Um, so, so this year, uh, as Abby, Andrea, and myself were out there, we kind of made a, a temporary game plan um, so in case we have another, you know, hurricane situation or other types of response needed, um, what we, we agreed to for the ESF 11 part of it is that Abby and myself will be a point of contact for Eden. And then for those states where ESF 11 is activated, um, we will help make the connections to the point of contacts in those states to know that it was activated to get their names into the regional um, person responsible and we'll also work on helping make connections so you know for your state and have made contact with those re re regional individuals um, but we'll we'll just kind of make it you know go down the chain and then why there's an active ESF 11 Abby and myself will will kind of help support and, and follow along but we really want our our states if there is an e active esf 11 the you or somebody from your extension might be more than one person to have the opportunity to be involved in that communications to know what's going on so when they activate um, their calls and their processes that you will be brought in to to that conversation and when I say you I'm talking about your point of contact your institution and then within your own institution you may need to determine who will be the the person or persons that would be involved with that active ESF 11. I would also mention that part of our game plan really includes having people use our Eden response note system and I've put a couple of messages out um, in, the, in different months here as the flooding was going on um, to, to that response notes. And I can do that again here um, to, to help keep that link active. We're using a Qualtrics system right now as our website gets going. But those response notes um, not only go to Beverly St Samuels, the Eden NIFA liaison, they go to Bill Halfman, who is in the Secretary of Ag's um, office and, and staff there, and Bill really helped get that system together. They will also go to Ron Walton, so that Ron from the ESF 11, the Ag side of things, the areas that, that Mike just covered for us, um, gets those notes. And the big thing about response notes is they don't have to be pretty you know this doesn't have to be like a formal report this is kind of the boots on the ground here's the information this is what we're seeing this could be some needs this is where you know our extension service is being involved um, in this situation or this is some resources that that we don't have that kind of information also helps those individuals um, you know run Bill Beverly, you know, respond to the questions that they may get from, you know, other um, political liaisons out there and, you know, and the government um, questions that come in and help give them, you know, some of the top coverage to a situation that um, when those questions come in. So just so we're aware um, of, of that current game plan um, that that we worked on um, pretty basic but we wanted to be sure that we had you know points of contact um, amongst ourselves and and to Ron um, and some other players as this moves forward so just if you have questions we'll kind of do a follow-up message on, on that part of it but wanted everybody to know that you know this is this is an early on conversation about extensions rule, ESF 11, each situation as Ron covered is gonna give us some, some differences um, in what the response is, how we're involved. 
Um, so, but it's important that we're in the communication to, to help ourselves out, our organizations out, um, and the, ex, you know, extension be involved um, at all the different levels. So after I add that, I haven't seen any other questions come in. Is there any, okay, so as I was making that statement, when and how do we update our point of contacts and member list in Edens um, with retirements? So Greg, to um, update your, your point of contacts, you know, your list in Eden, that information um, can, can be shared with Abby and she will um, help to get that information um, updated. We should be getting the, the, the new website going here um, shortly, so it might be a little bit of, of lag, um, but Abby would be your point to get that list in. And that's a good thing and reminder for everybody, um, you know, is to, to be sure that you look at your overall list in your states. Um, and, it, and it's okay, you know, we're not limited to the number of delegates from a state. Um, how, how would you communicate around ESF 11 in your state or for these ag and, and natural, um, natural resources types of emergencies? Abby, anything you want to add into that? I don't actually believe that I have anything additional to add. Um, and Greg, I'll go ahead and send you some information to get back to me. So I'm going to put um, any other questions to Mike. Mike, thank you um, again for, for everybody that's been participating here today. Um, the, a chance to open up, up this conversation um, for the Extension Disaster Education Network. I've had conversation as chair with Andrea Higdon, who is our Ag and Natural Resources Ending Committee Chair, um, about continuing this work over with that committee. So if this is an area of interest for you, I would really encourage your participation um, in the Ag and Natural Resources Standing Committee. Also a reminder that um, the National Workshop um, registration has opened up here and so to be looking um, if you can attend that our Eden um, national annual meeting and workshop where we can have some more conversation uh, around this topic and know that um, as we proceed here if any type of a, a situation arises um, that you, you know, we are in this conversation on ESF 11 and, and we will do our best to, to help support you in the response. With that, I thank everyone for your time and participating in this webinar today. Hopefully you've learned a little bit more about um, ESF 11 and the different partners and the different roles and maybe have generated some some questions for conversations. And, and Mike Sirach, thank you again for your time and, and involvement. I'm sure we'll be in further conversation. Abby, thank you for helping provide support on the back end of this. And see no more um, questions coming in. Um, I, I once again thank you and wish everyone a great day and enjoyable summertime. So with that, this is Cheryl Skolis and signing off from this webinar. Thanks, Cheryl. Bye now. <laughs>